Yeah, I mean, tonight was um, a little bit of the handcuffs off, if you will. Uh, we get to work with silly puns all night long. And we get to dive into kind of a topic that is um, a little bit taboo uh, now at the zoo in the animal world. Um, this is something that we kind of go over a lot. So it's not quite as taboo for us to be going over anatomy, to be going over behavior. Uh, but for a lot of people and a lot of um, just society, it can be a very taboo topic. Uh, but tonight for Woo at the Zoo, we get to jump right in and talk about love in the animal kingdom. And um, Alexis, there's a lot that's out there. There is a lot out there, Jed. Are you ready to do it? Let's do it. So let's start. Uh, of course, I have my uh, lovely puppy who's looking uh, very prime for Valentine's very Day. Uh, love is all around us. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about when we look at animals and we look at breeding and um, we look at mating and animals is the lengths that they go to to find a mate or to get to an area that is sustainable for um, uh, giving birth. And so the first topic today is gonna be talking about migration. And so would you say, Jed, this is similar to say, picking up your date across town perhaps, or it does take a while to get to that fancy restaurant, but let's just show them some comparisons, boys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So sometimes we have to migrate to pick up a date or to um, even travel maybe long distances, especially these days, um, to find uh, a potential companion. But let's talk about the animal that travels the furthest to find a mate and for breeding ground. And of course, that is the Arctic tern. Uh, the Arctic tern travels from pole to pole and from their breeding ground to their migratory feeding ground. And it's around 12,000 miles one way that these birds will fly. So about 25,000 miles round trip every year just to be able to find food and then travel back to be able to find a mate. I mean, that is just impressive that we have an animal that is willing to make that type of a journey just to find a mate. So you've talked about air. What about in the water, Jed? So we have not only our air, but also our water animals. And of course, the one that's most recognizable is our humpback whales. And humpback whales, again, will do these huge migratory patterns where they will feed in colder water, where it's more nutrient rich, where their fish are, where they can um, store up all that fat and get nice and big for their travel to their breeding ground and their calving ground, which is in warmer, shallow, more tropical waters. Uh, humpback whales can travel 3,000 miles in one, one length, 3,000 miles back and forth. So around a six to 7,000 mile round trip from a breeding calving ground to their feeding ground. And it's really interesting because um, once the cows reach their birthing grounds, there's no food there. And yeah, so I think, I think that's the neatest thing. I mean, they actually give birth and then they don't eat and allow the calves to nurse that entire length of time while they essentially starve themselves. They can lose upwards of 25 to 30% of their body weight, which is a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's just extraordinary, the lengths that animals go through. So um, using uh, Alexis's uh, analogy with um, going and picking up a date across uh, town, um, no excuses, guys, no excuses here. When we look <laughs> at the right lengths that these animals go through, <laughs> uh, no excuses on that's too far, um, or even that restaurant's out of distance. Uh, think about the Arctic turn, or the humpback whale. And this, this happens, you know, with several species. You know, one of them uh, most notably is our hoof sock animals, our hooved animals in the Serengeti. And actually right now in February is the time where over half a million uh, hoofed animals are being born 
on the Serengeti. So during June and July is when these animals are migrating up to the central Serengeti, and then they go back into their breeding grounds or their birthing grounds in the southern Serengeti. And during the months of January and March, over half a million babies are born in those few months. Half a million. I yeah, mean, didn't you get to didn't you get to see this when you were recently there? Yeah, last year, um, Dr. Sue Tagowski, our director of zoo operations and myself were able to lead a trip to Tanzania. This is a picture that I took in the Serengeti. Wow. And it was extraordinary because all these births are really timed and they're timed for all these calves to drop. And that's, that's for a specific reason, right, Alexis? Yeah, exactly. And that's because um, obviously there's safety in numbers, Jed, but as you mentioned, the food source is most abundant. And so what they're trying to do is not only maximize their nutrition, but also maximize the protection of the herd. Yeah, and so all these babies are born, about 8,000 of these babies are born every single day. And by doing that, just like Alexa said, this is going to um, strengthen their odds of surviving because where you have this many prey animals, you're obviously gonna have the predators. They're gonna be following behind and picking off all of the weaklings or ones that weren't able to get up. And uh, we were really fortunate to see a wildebeest calf being born. And it's about a, a 30 minute video. So I wasn't gonna show it during this, but just to walk through that, we saw a cow with hooves coming out. Um, so she was in the process of birthing and she delayed that birth because she would look around and lay down, start pushing, and then she would get a whiff of a potential predator. And if we were to look about a mile, two miles out with binoculars, we could see the hyenas and the jackals that were not far behind. So she realized that, you know, for her best chances of survival of the calf, she needed to move. And so she kept running and running with legs sticking out of the back. And to, we finally got to a point where she felt that either she couldn't hold anymore or that it was safe enough and um, was able to deliver that calf with the last pushes from when she lay down about three minutes. And then the, Ability for this offspring to be able to stand in the amount of time was also within minutes, really. It was within minutes. I mean, within yeah. five minutes, that calf was standing. Within seven minutes, that calf was walking. Within nine minutes, because we timed it, that calf was running with mom almost full speed. I mean, nine minutes from from That's, dropping. That is just like humans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can say that because I have three of them. Probably like, no, like maybe nine months to a year for a baby to start walking. I mean, these things, it's, it's really extraordinary. Now, Alexis, with our uh, prey animals, we tend to have a little bit longer a gestation period, and they typically only have one offspring, and that's to help that survival. Yeah, and that's what's called, uh, when, when prey offspring are born, they're often called precocial. And the opposite of that is altricial, which is what humans are, meaning precocial prey or precocial uh, babies come out and they are really precocious. They, just like it sounds, they are ready to go. That's because they have got to be able to survive almost immediately on their own. And that's different than say humans, primates, or even something like a baby bird, for example. Those are more what we call altricial species. Yeah, those really depend on their parents to protect them um, until they can grow large enough to somewhat fend for themselves. Uh, what an amazing thing, migration, um, that animals will go through to be able to find a mate and to be able to find a safe place to have their offspring. Um, so let's move out of migration and talk a little bit about what we do here at the zoo, which is our species survival plan. So uh, Dr. Roth, talk to us a little bit about what is the species survival plan? Yeah, not a lot of people know about the, what's called the Species Survival Plan, Jed. And this is an institution that was developed in about 1981. And it was designed by the American uh, Zoological Association. And, and the goal is to basically preserve genetic diversity across our captive breeding population. And so zoos do not just breed animals because they want to breed animals. They breed them in an attempt to preserve their genetics and of course ultimately the conservation of species and that's based on 
how many animals are at what zoos, space requirements, husbandry requirements. So there's a lot that goes into not only moving animals, but specifically moving them to breed. Yeah, it's a very complicated process that we have to communicate and work with several different facilities. And I equate this to a large internet dating site. I mean, we all know about internet dating right now. Um, if we were on that internet dating site, we would have a profile. That profile would have attributes and characteristics about ourselves um, that maybe we're trying to find another mate. And um, very similar is the SSP. So um, we have each animal that has their genetic lineage and some of their characteristics, their age, um, all those fun things. And that's how we kind of pair those animals up. Uh, and at our zoo, we have several species that are in an SSP. And this last year, April 6, we had a pretty big baby born. Let's see it. Let's see it. Show us the pictures. Oh, there, there she is. There she is. <laughs> there is little Penzi. There is um, just so, nothing cuter. So this was day two um, when Penzi was born. And we have a very successful African elephant breeding program that's part of that SSP. Yeah, and, and our program um, is actually really unique, Jed, because we have a bull, as everyone knows, Mabu, who tips the scales at about 13,000 pounds, um, who is successful at breeding naturally. And that is a big deal for an SSP program and a big deal for us at Reed Park Zoo. Um, a lot of institutions, um, are breeding via artificial insemination. And so for us to be able to breed naturally um, is something that we're really proud of. And obviously very successfully, um, Mabu is a really great bull and our family dynamics um, are wonderful as well. And there's little Pinzi there who is almost a thousand pounds now, Jed, which is different than day two where she was probably about 295 pounds. Yeah, I mean, she's growing big. She's coming up on her one-year birthday, um, and she's there with her big sister, Nandi, who, of course, was the first elephant ever born here at Reed Park Zoo. And um, that gestation period for an elephant is the longest of any mammal. It's pretty long. Two years. Yeah, effectively two years. That that cow is growing that baby. Um, and again, when, when Penzi was born, um, it didn't take long for her to get up and start walking around and start nursing. Yeah, and she, both her and mom did everything perfectly and everything by the book, which of course makes us like super, look like superstars. Yeah, it's much easier when we don't have to uh, provide any assistance. We are there, of course, if we needed to. Yeah. Now, you just kind of brushed over artificial insemination um, AI. We're gonna dive into that just a little bit more here. Um, AI is a somewhat tricky thing, but it's something that is used because if we needed to move a bull elephant, there's a lot of logistics that are involved in that. So if we can just transport that bull semen, it's much easier. Um, but it this is. is a challenge because we have to collect that sample and then be able to inseminate the female. So there's a lot of challenges that go around that. Yeah, and, it, and it's, you know, it's not just like baking a cake. Unfortunately, you do have to collect the semen, which requires a fair amount of effort, uh, mostly on the bull's part. Um, you have to preserve that sample very, very specifically, and you have to have some uh, pretty fancy equipment to be able to do that, which thanks to several very wonderful donors, we do have that capability here at Reed Park Zoo. Um, and then we have to be able to ship that sample across the country at exactly the right moment that the female is receptive and can be inseminated oftentimes under anesthesia. So it, it is really a major planning event. So when you say receptive, um, how do we know when a female, let's just use elephants for example, how do we know when that female elephant is receptive? Oftentimes it's behavioral signals, but for us, um, we also monitor hormone levels, both in the urine and the feces. And so we can track exact days of the cycle that may be the most beneficial for us to inseminate. 
Yeah, it's very fascinating. But as you said, uh, Mabu did his thing. He knows what he's doing. He's a very successful. No role. coaching necessary. Uh, he, no coaching necessary. So, um, and then we also had some meerkat pups born. So this is another one of our SSP programs here at the zoo. Exactly. And um, boy, those little things are cute, aren't they? Yeah, they're um, big too. I mean, they're almost the size of the parents. Yeah, and yeah. Right now you can't tell them apart. And so we had two females that gave birth almost simultaneously. And again, that is just like you were talking about the hoofstock in the wild. And they do that for a reason. Um, both females were able to um, kind of co-parent and co-rear and co-nurse. And the male meerkat actually also plays a very essential role. Again, just like humans, Jed. Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, and this isn't for all species out there. A lot of times the females really left, you know, raising the, the youngsters, uh, the offspring on their own, but a meerkat family group is called a mob. They work together. Um, the both moms were nursing all of the pups and dad helped to raise. And this leads to a higher success rate for the offspring and um, that family group, more eyes watching everybody, more people tending. Um, it takes a village to raise a family, right? So, I mean, we definitely know that with, with our own kids uh, that we have our family that helps out. So that was uh, that's pretty amazing. Let's move on. Um, let's start getting into a little bit more of our uh, our woo at the zoo talk here. I was Are you gonna I, I love this picture that you put on here. Start to talk about something juicy soon or what? There you go. That's what we're going to get into. So puberty can be an awkward time for peacocks. Um, I think it could probably be an awkward time for every species out there, uh, especially mammals, especially humans. And um, we definitely see that with some of our uh, own animals as they grow up. Um, they go through this kind of um, adolescent stage where they're really trying to learn how to be an adult, but don't quite know how to do it yet. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Sun Tzu being a 10 year old bull right now. Um, we've had, uh, you know, when we first got Jasiri as a young bull, oh, he was boy. trying to um, uh, breed our females at the time. And he wasn't tall enough to be able to mount on the back of the females. And so to me, that's kind of puberty can be an awkward time, uh, even for animals out there. So uh, let's dive into some of these things uh, that we're going to be going over today. Um, and whether or not you pick up any information from this that you can take on and share with other people, that would be great if you just have fun and get a fun laugh out of tonight and have a good evening. Um, again, just want to thank you guys for joining us and um, helping out to raise some funds for Reed Park Zoo in a very fun and informational and educational way. So um, hopefully you guys enjoy what we're going to go over next because we are going to jump right into the crazy primates of the world, um, not uh, um, the, the bunnies and the Playboy uh, model there, but, uh, or icon there, but we are going to be talking about primates and penises. That's right, we're jumping right into <laughs> Did you just primates. say, did, did you just say that? I did, primates okay. and penises, here we go. So um, Alexis, gorillas are the largest primates in the world. So one would think that they probably have the largest penises. You know what, Jed, the gorilla is definitely an impressive animal. Weighing in, the male silverback weighs in at usually around 450 pounds or so. However, gentlemen, just because you are the largest primate, that does not mean you have the largest <clears throat> appendage, as Jed so eloquently put it. So unfortunately, their penis is roughly two inches long. Two inches for a 450-pound gorilla. Um, it doesn't seem like that should work, but it's the silverback gorilla commands the respect of the troop because of their size. Um, the ladies aren't necessarily there for the size of his penis, uh, but they're there for his protection. And the large silverback um, gets breeding rights with all of the females within his troop. Right, so the, a, a troop of um, gorillas, uh, usually one male will command upwards of 30 females. So again, like you said, Jed, it is not the size that matters. Okay, so then let's get into what primate has the largest penis per body size? Hmm, who could that be? I know you're waiting for it. 
Yes, it is humans. Yeah. <laughs> this this was the slide, everyone. Do you see the celebration here? <laughs> there we go, boys. Uh, so. Um, you know, and whether or not it's an evolutionary trait, um, it's it's really hard to be able to determine and know. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we look at something, you know, like a gorilla, 450 pounds, um, you know, the penis size doesn't always go with the size of the animal. And that's just very interesting. So um, there we go, boys. Um, we, uh, we at least have something that we can cheer about uh, tonight. Um, we don't always get to cheer about things, so we're gonna cheer about that. Um, and, uh, you know, primates are also known um, for, for, you know, their lovemaking and um, none do it better than the bonobos. Yeah, so the bonobos, Jed, are actually a primate where their entire social structure really does result, revolve around sex. And so they use sex as a means of communication, they use it to trade for food items, they use it as a social status, and they just use it because they actually enjoy it. They are really one of the only species other than primates that is known to tongue kiss um, for a reason. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary that they figured out, hey, let's uh, let's just do this instead of argue and bicker and um, seems a lot easier um, than getting injured, you know, a lot more fun. And I know within zoos, uh, bonobo hab habitats um, can be definitely an X-rated habitat because there's um, a lot of love making that goes on there. So, um, you know, it's uh, a lot of animals will use sex for, um, get in their way or because they enjoy it. So, you know, we can find a lot of similarities between um, some of our wild counterparts and ourselves. Uh, I'm not going to get more into that, but the bonobo um, is definitely out there showing how to make love and not war. Um, then let's get into a little bit of um, our boys. We've talked about them already, but let's get into some of the things that uh, our boys are going to do out there and, and only the strong survive. I mean, this is the evolutionary trait of passing on the strongest genes and boys will fight to the death to be able to have breeding rights with the ladies. Yeah, and, and that's an evolutionary trait, Jed, because as you pointed out, it is the strongest male that gets to pass on their genetics. And as everyone knows, lion mating is generally fast, it's generally furious, and it's oftentimes unsuccessful. What you may not know about lion breeding is that the male, um, during coitus, it usually takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Good job, boys. However- <laughs> They try. Right, right, I was waiting. However, this happens about every 20 to 30 minutes for at least three to four days, and that ensures successful reproduction. And they also, as the dominant male lion, um, they are going to want to pass on their genes to as many females as they can. So typically, there can be anywhere from five to 20 lionesses uh, in that pride, and he can breed with all of them that are sexually mature. Now, the reign of a male lion doesn't last that long. They have to wait until they're maybe around eight years old until they're big and strong enough to be able to overthrow another male lion. And then it's hard being a male lion. They're battling a lot. They get beat up a lot. Yes, the females do the hunting. I get Thank it. Thank you. Yes, the ladies I'm do sorry, hunting. wait. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Yep. The yes, females do yes. all the work. The females do all the hunting, but the males got a battle. The males are the protectors, right. and uh, usually they are protectors from other male lions. Because if that male lion gets overthrown by a competitor, the first thing that that competitor is going to do is kill all the cubs. And the, by killing all the cubs, it puts the females back in estrus where that new male can then pass on their genes. Exactly. And you were saying that um, lions are... Um, uh, induced ovulators. Induced ovulators, yeah. So um, the stimulus of mating will release an egg and allow for fertilization. 
Exactly. Um, and so that's why that male lion is so important for the pride because he's protecting those lionesses cubs. And they know that if another male comes in, there's a good chance that that new male is going to kill all the lions uh, or all the cubs. And so, yes, the ladies do all the hunting. I get it. Male lions are lazy. Um, they don't last that long. Let's just bash on our male lions. Uh, but, you know, they serve a really good purpose. And um, the strongest survive passing on those strong genes does ensure that the offspring of the future are going to be the strongest animals and the greatest ones that will have success at survival. So there's there's definitely a good um, reason for this. Now let's get to the biggest and the baddest of our land animals, um, which of course is our, our male elephants. Male elephants, Afri male African elephants, um, again, not to go back to penis size. However, they do boast the largest penis size of any land mammal at upwards of six to seven feet, Ted. Six to seven foot long penis. Um, yes. That's, um, that's impressive. That is um, impressive. And we have, what? as you said, Mabu, our bull elephant here, and um, he sometimes is in breeding mode and does display, and it's an opportunity to learn um, and, uh, you know, to be impressed. Exactly. And I think on that previous slide, you had a term up there called must. And must is the term that we use when the male elephant is in breeding mode. And that's a, um, a term that actually uh, is a, a form of a word that means intoxication. And that's often because when male elephants are in must and pursuing the female, um, they act intoxicated. They oftentimes forget to eat, they forget to drink. Um, we used to, scientists used to call it green penis disease because they would get a thick, heavy green discharge um, because they would ultimately dehydrate themselves in pursuit of a female. Yeah, and this happens a lot with the males where they really will neglect their own immune system to focus on getting someplace as fast as they can to be the first one there to breed with the female, um, or they just focus on getting big and strong. Um, they don't care where they go, if they go into other animals' territories. And it, it really gets males into a lot of trouble um, where they may be able to get there first or be strong enough to overthrow other bulls, but they tend to not live as long as the females because they are really neglecting their immune system just to be able to be the strongest and be able to breed. Again, I think that sounds familiar. <laughs> Yes, us boys uh, definitely uh, have a lot in or us males or humans <laughs> have a lot in common with um, some of our animal counterparts. Um, and it's quite impressive. Um, you know, the length of the penis of the male elephant is really what they need to be able to properly mount on the back of a female and to reach the vulva to properly copulate. Exactly. Have I told you how nice your boa looks recently? Oh, thank you. I just, I'm, I'm loving it. I've kind of forgot that it's on, it's just a, a part of me now. So I'll have to remember to take it okay. off. Otherwise people may look at me funny or they might, or they might not. I don't know. Or might not. Um, so let's talk about, um, you know, some other animals that um, win some tournaments and the gray yeah. whale is definitely one of them. Yeah, the gray whale actually boasts the largest penis size of all mammals and that's 10 to 12 feet. But relative to body size, again, uh, the elephant has it. What's interesting about the gray whale, Jed, is that um, in bre when breeding, it's usually two males that pursue a female. And unfortunately, the loser male ends up having to support the female, like a big blubbery headboard, basically, while the other male mates. Yeah, and the, the males are much smaller than the females. Yep. Um, and so that other male is basically supporting, um, which is interesting how they communicate that, oh, I've lost, so this is my job now. But uh, I don't know. Somehow that happens. Um, and we have a lot of our aquatic animals that also have prehensile penises. We do, yes. Um, I'm hoping you have a picture of some other ones coming up. Oh, boy. Yep. Who well, could talk about penises without discussing a pig? Go ahead and throw it up. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, you know, we tend to think of a penis shape as all very similar, um, basically, but um, they're not. They come in all different shapes and sizes. 
And the pigs is an interesting one. Yeah, and again, um, there is an evolutionary purpose to this madness, Jed. So pigs have what's called a corkscrew penis. And the reason for that is because the female body parts are also shaped like a corkscrew. And so this is a very um, evolutionarily designed uh, feature and this prevents hybridization between the various species. So it's actually a pretty neat um, invention. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's amazing that, you know, it's going to stop other animals from, you know, crossbreeding. Um, yeah. And, you know, in some areas of the world, uh, pig penises are delicacies. Oh, dear. So, I mean, hey, who am I to, you know, I don't knock it till you try it, Alexis. Right, um, that's you know, a good who, point. Who, who am I to say that it's uh, it's bad, but, um, you know, it's it's just an, it's a, just an interesting Is thing there a dipping there. sauce, Is, uh, like a sauce of some sort, at least? My guess would probably be, I don't know, it's on a shish kebab, so probably barbecue and no. I don't know, barbecue sauce. Again, no. don't knock it till you try it, but, um, you know, it's it's one of those things. As we move on, we've learned about um, the largest penises in the world, and um, this, this one for our mammals. Um, fifth of an inch. Wins the race of the smallest. The fifth of an inch. But Jed, again, relative to body size, very well endowed. Yeah, so um, rodents um, are, are small themselves, but, um, you know, still are able to get the job done. And rodents can be fairly um, active breeders um, and uh, very successful in, um, in having offspring, which is why we can have uh, a lot of rodents out there. So um, they're clearly successful at what they do. All right. Uh, now, this oh. is one of my favorite ones that we get to talk about, talk about, which of course is the baculum. The baculum. So the baculum, Jed, is the penis bone, otherwise known as the penis bone. So everyone can see in that picture what looks like a third leg is not. That's actually the bone that certain species have inside their penis. And why would an animal evolve to have an adaptation of a baculum? Yeah, well, this is actually an x-ray um, that I took of an otter. Um, and the reason that the otter has one is, as you can imagine, they're oftentimes in the water um, when they're mating. So this is to provide uh, rigidness. And it's interesting that some mammals have baculum, others don't. There's actually some primates that have baculums very closely related to us. Um, but humans clearly don't have a baculum. So somewhere along the line, we didn't need a baculum. Um, and it's just interesting that some mammals have and some mammals don't. Yeah, exactly. Thumb or no thumb. So, th so there you guys go. Um, if you have never heard of or seen a baculum, um, here is a great x-ray of what one looks like. Uh, I, I know in some cultures, they use baculums as jewelry as well. Um, so, you know, again, um, you know, to each their own, but um, you can find walrus baculums and some primate baculums and obviously otters have baculums. So very interesting um, addition to some mammals anatomies. Uh, and then we have some animals that you look at in the animal kingdom and you kind of say, how can that work? And I feel, there's, yeah. There's no better I, example than the porcupine. I feel professionally obligated to talk about this one because I know you all are wondering. So the porcupine is actually only receptive for about three to four hours out of the entire year. So if you're a male porcupine, you better get it right. And the way this works is that the male porcupine will approach the female, hands above his head, waving his hands just in case, and start squirting urine at the female. If the female is receptive, she will raise her quills and back up into the male and allow breeding. The female, however, during this three to four hours is absolutely insatiable. And if the male tires, she will simply leave him and find another. Wow. wow. And I mean, porcupines have 30,000 quills on them. I mean, that's a risky move for a male to, because at any moment those quills could come down and really injure some sensitive anatomy that's right there. Um, hands up, Jed, hands up. Hands up. I mean, that, 
Yeah. Um, that is just, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary how an animal who has such great defensive adaptations, like a porcupine with their quills, um, has still found a way and three hours out of the year yeah. that That's these it. two have to find each other. I know it. I mean, it's that's just extraordinary. Um, and uh, porcupines, one of those amazing animals out there in the animal kingdom. Um, now, porcupines are uh, a dangerous intercourse, um, but there's some that get even a little bit more than porcupine quills. And that's where we've got to talk about our insects. Um, these guys are known for kind of consuming the males, if we will. Um, yeah, I mean, course. you know what? It just, it happens, Jed. Um, everyone's familiar with the praying mantis. Um, the female praying mantis um, after uh, coitus oftentimes will bite the head off the male um, and consume him. Um, what's interesting, Jed, is that uh, what we know in breeding these animals in captivity is that if you tie the legs of the female um, during breeding, they will actually not consume the male afterwards. So I guess cannibalism isn't necessarily a, an integral part of coitus for them. So it must be, oh, I don't know, something, you know, after intercourse, the female turns around and like grabs a hole and is like, well, I've got you anyway. Now I guess I'll eat you. Like, what I mean, is that all about? I, just, um, I mean, you know, that's that's a risky, that's a risky move for the male. But here's the thing is that the males get eaten and they can't go tell their other boat buddies that, hey, be careful, because after you're done, uh, she's going to turn around and eat you. You know, hey. I mean. It's just, uh, you know, the porcupines can talk and say, hey, I did this wrong. That's why I've got a quill in my uh, abdomen, but um, don't try that. But these guys, they just get eaten. I mean, that's just, I don't know, bugs, bugs or something else. Um, yeah, and and yeah. then we talk about our flies. Yeah, so the same thing for numerous species of flies, actually, Jed. What's interesting about flies is there are several species that will breed with their mouth parts uh, put together as well as their um, rear ends put together and at the end of intercourse the female will actually suck out the insides of the male and consume him literally from the inside out. Um, another yeah. interesting fact. What's going on another, here with these guys? Another interesting fact is that the sperm of several species of flies are actually at least five times the body size of the fly itself. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know why. It's, a, it's extraordinary informa information, um, but I mean, these guys, I tell you, uh -huh. uh, and, and then what about when we've got, you know, weapons that are involved? I mean, we right. talked about porcupine quills. Uh, a lot of animals out there have weapons to defend themselves like a scorpion. Yeah, what's neat about the scorpions is that the male scorpion will actually deposit a packet of sperm on the ground and then run over to the female and grab her um, obviously with his uh, pinchers and sting her in an attempt to subdue her. Um, however, porcupines are immune to their scorpions. own venom. Yep. Scorpions so, are immune. Uh, scorpions, sorry, por not porcupines, same thing, yeah. all pokey. So yeah. what the male scorpion will do is grab her and bring her over to the packet of sperm on the ground and basically force her to sit on it. I mean, that's some pretty good eyesight that that male's gotta have to be like, this is where it's at right here um and you know avoid you know all the weapons but like you said um scorpions are immune to their own venom so they're not going to kill each other um but they may have a small effect that might sedate a little bit um so i mean it's it's quite the battle that has to happen with some of these animals uh and then we get to one of the most infamous insects out there outside of the praying mantis which of course is the black widow um, and we can see the size difference right here of a male and a female. It's pretty typical the female insect is much larger. And this is another one that the female tends to kill the male. Yeah, exactly. The, the female um, after intercourse oftentimes consumes the male. Uh, but look how beautiful she is. She is beautiful. It's amazing um, that red hourglass shape on the abdomen uh, of the black widow spider. Um, I mean, it's it's an impressive animal. I wonder if it's like a nutrition depletion or if, um, you know, maybe that that extra nutrition 
um, helps to fertilize. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what that is that a lot of these insects want to turn around and just kill whatever that, you know, whatever's, you know, mating with them. I mean, it's just, it's pretty wild. Um, and uh, I love this comic here. Can't we just get a divorce? Um, yeah, I mean, no, a lot of the males die. I mean, that's, that's right? the yeah. thing. Yeah, so it um, might be sexual frustration, Jed. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we see this with our tarantulas as well. Uh, most of the time, we will see our male tarantulas out walking around here in the Sonoran Desert. We have the Arizona blonde tarantula, but a lot of times the tarantula that we see is a male which doesn't have that those blonde hairs, it's more black and copper. And what the males are doing is they're going out in search of a female. And a very similar thing happens. Once they find a female in a den, the female will, you know, check to see if she likes this guy and then invite him down in. Um, the male will typically breed. And then soon after that male dies. Um, so all those males that are going on marches when we have our monsoon season, um, they're looking for mates and oftentimes they do not survive after that. So um, yeah, spiders are just interesting creatures in how they reproduce and um, just the, the methods that they go through. Um, let's get into another spider. Um, this is my bondage spider, right? So um, this male has figured out how to not be eaten um, after intercourse with the female. And the way he does it is he binds her legs with his silk thread. Um, so he makes a web around her legs so that then he can breed with her and um, then get out of there before she turns around and eats him. Yeah, and, and the lynx spider actually, Jed, doesn't even have a penis. So after he binds her legs, he uses some adaptive mouth parts to deposit sperm inside her body in a very specific location. And then, as you said, he runs like hell. I mean, look at this. I mean, that's just, uh, that's pretty smart. I think the male lynx spider needs to team up with the black widow spider and say, hey, um, I got a plan for you. You need to try this, okay? <laughs> um, this might be the way that you are able to breed and not be eaten. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking, maybe let's try to set up that meeting with the two spiders and, and see what happens. Who knows? Um, let's get into oh. a, a, an animal um that is very interesting uh actually has male and female sexual characteristics yeah so the flatworm um like all sea slugs is a hermaphrodite and so the way that they actually breed is they will meet each other let's just say at an undisclosed location in the ocean um and they have two uh swords that they actually use to fight with but also they serve as their penises the loser of this fight gets stabbed in the abdomen with the sword, and that actually is their, it, them being inseminated. And the loser then goes off to bear the burden of motherhood. So this is um, penis fencing for penis fencing. Uh, for breeding. Um, well said. I mean, let's- The doctor, let's... yes, the doctor word for this is called traumatic insemination. Yeah. That's pretty traumatic. Um, I mean, that's just wild. I, I love some of our other animals out there. Um, Same and, thing for these guys, Jed. Same yeah. thing. So the, the male will end up injecting yeah. into the abdomen of the female? Stabs the female in the abdomen, um, deposits the sperm, and then runs. Unreal. Unreal. And it's you rude. talked about it's the banana just slug. Rude. Yeah, just rude, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just unnecessary. Um, the banana slug can even take it a little bit further after they're done breeding. Right. Well, the banana slug actually has a penis that's oftentimes twice the length of their actual body. So when they are finding a mate, they have to find a mate that is big enough. Oftentimes, however, when they're done, the female just chews off the penis and off she goes. That's that's just that's just mean. I, I mean, you know, come on. Um, <laughs> And is it because the penis may get stuck or we, we don't know, or maybe it acts as a plug uh, yeah. so that another uh, bana a banana slug can't mate with her? I mean, they, it's they be think a little bit of both, exactly. Yeah, I mean, just extraordinary thing. Um, let's get into some uh, sexually adventurous animals out there. Um, yes, we have our primates for sure. They are definitely sexually adventurous, but we also have our tortoises. 
Yeah, and so tortoises, everybody always asks me, how in the world do they breed? Well, ladies, um, the females do have that protective shell. The males have a very specific adaptation on the underside of their shell that has a curve that allows them to fit perfectly on the back end of the female. However, ladies, the female can just pull herself into the shell and protect herself if she is not ready. At which point the male tries to run around to the front of the female, bite her in the face, which causes her to stick her rumpus out. And then this is a little bit humorous. He has to make it around to the backside again before she pulls her rumpus in. So it, there's a little bit of timing involved here. Yeah, and um, tortoise is obviously not known for their speed. So um, this is an interesting game of tag from one <laughs> side to the other. And just like you said, the males had that concave shape that if they had a flat shape, they would just slip right off of the back of the female. So, um, I mean, that shape really allows them to properly breed on the back of a female. Um, I mean, that's, uh, you know, an interesting way of getting what you want, of uh, biting the face to push the rump out. But, you know, hey, I guess that's the animal world. Um, yeah. And then some of our tortoises can have quite the size difference as well. Um, this is a, I believe, a Galapagos tortoise, and we have Aldabra tortoises here at the zoo. Um, Herbie is our male, and Herbie was named after Herbie the love bug, and uh, Herbie is a very amorous tortoise, and so during breeding season, we often will see this. We will often see this, and we will often hear this from across the zoo. <laughs> yes, so tortoise breeding noise. Um, uh, they do make this loud noise that you can really hear echoing. Don't uh, do the it. Males going out, going. Argh! Don't do it. Don't Argh! do it. <laughs> oh, you knew I was going to. Uh, come on, let's be honest here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive, especially the size difference. But um, again, for our giant tortoises, uh, Herbie weighs around 500 pounds. A female is what weigh around 200 pounds. Exactly. And, and how old is Herbie now, Jed? Herbie's 73. So just a youngster. Uh, just when you can a live youngster. 150 years um, in his uh, young 70s, he's just uh, hitting his prime there. Uh, so as we move on. Um, oh, you know, snake orgy. Snake orgy. And, and we often have a lot of species that become sexually active when a lot of the same species are together. Snakes are definitely one of them. Yeah, this is a pile of garter snakes. And so when the females come out from underground, they emit a very specific pheromone and that can attract male snakes from miles around. And that's exactly what's happening here. So and you, that, have again, of, you have a lot of males that are all trying to get in there um, and have breeding rights to that, fe the, that female. And we end up with a giant snake orgy um, and uh, just very interesting um, we also will see that in some of our sharks. Um, white sharks is one that have been seen at a whale carcass as they're feeding. Um, they tend to get excited and it can be um, stimulating. And so um, you'll see, you know, shark orgies as well, even though we've never documented a white shark breeding, um, it's definitely something we believe uh, helps to stimulate reproduction in a lot of our shark species as well. So um, uh, snake orgies and shark orgies, there you go. Um, who knew? All right, and uh, yes, let's talk. We talk a little bit more about bug sex. We talked a little bit already about um, some of them that get killed, um, but um, you know, let's talk about the ladybug. Oh yeah, this is a cutie. So it, you, what's really neat about ladybugs, Jed, is that they are able to store the sperm of the male for upwards of three to four months uh, until there are optimal conditions outside for them to actually lay their eggs. And so when they see that the moisture is right, the humidity, the food, uh, the temperature, they're able to actually lay their eggs and um, reproduce, which is a really neat adaptation. Yeah, that's pretty impressive, especially since we were talking um, earlier about artificial insemination. And if we were to collect a sample, the just what we would have to do to keep that sample viable um, is, you know, extensive, but somehow the ladybug three months can store um, and then wait till the time is right. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, and um, we do have threesomes in the animal world. Uh, this is two males and a female um, that are trying to be the last one to breed this female. 
And a lot of our bugs will have specific shaped penises so that each time as they're having intercourse, their penis will actually clear out the sperm of the male that was having um, intercourse before them. Uh, and I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, the last one is the most successful always. So you tend to see uh, multiple males will be on the back um, trying to buy their time till one is done and then be the last one. Um, I love millipedes. Um, they're amazing. You do love animals, millipedes. I'm going to let uh, you talk about this one, Jed. I know yeah. how excited you are about oh, this. I love the millipede. Millipedes have two penises and it is their third leg. And so they <laughs> will walk on their penises. And then what they'll do is with their other legs, they'll grab a hold of the female from underneath, just like you're seeing here and then be able to inseminate through those dual penises um, from the back. I mean, what a handy tool. Look at all these legs <laughs> that you have. We talk about uh, prehensile penises with our marine mammals because they can't grab a hold of everything. Um, you know, they have to be able to manipulate that penis. Uh, but a millipede, I mean, they've got, look at all these arms, look at all these helpers they got. I mean, and you know, what a handy tool. Love the millipede. Anywho. Um, oh. Hey. <laughs> this is a good, this is an interesting one. Let me do this one, Jed. There you so go. this is this is a moth mite. Um, and the female moth mite uh gives birth, and let's just say she gives birth to a male, so to a son. The son will hang around and wait for her to continue to give birth to additional offspring. If the offspring are male, he will ignore them. However, if the offspring are female, he will forcibly remove them from his mother and breed with those females and then off they go to bear his young. And this will happen repeatedly until he's exhausted himself. I, I, I gotta be honest, um, I like the millipede story better. Uh, yeah, I would, I mean, weird, these, it's just weird. These little boogers, man. I mean, and, and of course, um, you know, they, they do feed off of mammalian flesh um, and it, they can be the nasty little things that we get in our, uh, in our hair, um, in unsanitary conditions. And, um, so that's, uh, going on, um, in their host, basically. Ugh. Change yeah. the slide. Change All right, let's slide. get off of those guys. Um, uh, and, you know, we talked about lions, um, having intercourse for 20 seconds. Let's talk about the longest coital session that has been measured and that goes to our reptile goes to our snake and it's 22 hours 22 hours yeah well they also have spiked penises so it, it may have been a dismount issue yeah and so again that those spiked penises help so that they are able to stay obviously in the female long enough um but sometimes those spikes can actually get caught um, yep, exactly. and, and that can cause, you know, either them to stay connected lo along, um, or it can even cause damage. Exactly, so, Jen. Um, all right. Um, least expected masturbatory uh, uh, activity. Yes, that's right. We're going to talk about masturbation. Um, <laughs> and we're going to talk about it with this guy here. And it's not what you think. Um, yeah. It so actually has to do with their antlers with their antlers and when uh male cervids so deer in other words elk etc are in rut which is the kind of a similar term for what we used in elephants and must um their antlers actually become uh very uh sensitive and it's multi you know we've seen multiple males wandering around through the forest rubbing their antlers um on twigs and leaves etc just uh in an attempt to get an erection what I find interesting about that is that almost within the same session, they're clashing these antlers um, very hard against another male. And I, I just don't know how they tolerate that. Yeah, I mean, they go from arousal to a boxing ring. And yeah. um, it's just, uh, but I guess, you know, there it's, it's a very sensitive time for the antlers. And so that clearly... Um, sensitivity can cause an erection, can cause arousal, um, and um, can cause the you know deer to be excited. So um, again, very interesting. Um, so let's um, talk about some of the links the males would go to. Um, we you know I mean the best case example of course is our seahorse because the male seahorse is the one that carries the offspring. 
So for the feminists in the crowd, you'll enjoy this. Um, the female actually has what appears to be a penis-like attachment where she deposits her eggs into the abdomen of the male. Um, when she does that, that stimulates the male to release his sperm into the same abdominal pouch, essentially impregnating him. And off he goes to bear the burden of motherhood. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. I mean, just amazing. Um, this is something that we tend to see at our zoo quite a bit. Uh, testing of urine. There are several animal species out there that will test the urine of a female. Alexis, why do they do this? Yeah, again, Jed, this is a hormone thing. And so um, males have a very specific organ um, in their uh, sinus structure that is able to detect very specific levels of hormones and determine when the female is receptive for breeding. Um, what happens after that is he basically just chases her around until she gives up and allows him to breed. Yeah, after they do the, you know, test the urine, they'll do that Fleming response where they'll kind of curl the, the top lip back and open their mouth a little bit. Um, that must be, you know, gaining all those access to all those receptors uh, that is giving that information to the male saying, yeah, this is a good time for breeding. Um, I mean, you know, to us, maybe that looks odd and weird, but what an amazing you know, evolutionary trait that the males have figured out to say, hey, I'm not going to waste my time with you because you're not ready, um, but you're ready. So now this is the time. Um, exactly. And I know when our giraffe, uh, our male giraffe does this, you know, we get a lot of questions about it. And again, it's a great time to be able to teach and to be able to learn and to be under, able to understand. I mean, we're being somewhat jocular about the, all these things tonight, but um, you know, if you really look at it, uh, this is really amazing evolution that has given these animals um, life over you know hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years with some species, um, and you know they clearly have figured something out and they're doing it right. Um, so uh, let's talk about another hero as a dad. Uh, we can't. We got to look at our hornbills um, if we're looking at our uh, you know a species that the, the dad is really doing a lot of work to make sure to raise those offspring. Look at these doting fathers, Jed. Look at these doting dads. You go dads, I'm one too. <laughs> Battle on. So I think you have a picture of some very successful hornbills um, at Reed Park. And um, what's really interesting about this is that the female will mud themselves in and you can see that in that top picture there. And the male is responsible, um, the only one responsible for bringing her food and allowing her to be able to raise those chicks uh, inside that mud nest. And the, she does not emerge until those chicks are ready to survive on their own. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty amazing. They, they're doing this to protect themselves from predators. Um, so it, it's a great cave shield for the female to not have to worry about predators coming in. But there's a lot of trust that has to be involved here with that female being locked into this cave and the male having to find food, avoid predation to bring food back to the female and then also to the chicks as they start to get a little bit bigger and they don't come out of that nest until those chicks are fairly large and able to survive on their own. So um, what, what an extraordinary species that goes through again, some just tremendous lengths um, for survival and for helping to protect their offspring. Um, now this one oh, is- Oh, I this like this one. Is, one. This one is just bizarre. This is another bizarre one. Oh, let me do it. Let me do it. It's so this you. is the this is the uh, deep sea anglerfish, and so the female, which is the larger of the fish, um, lives way down deep, and so she has a little flashlight, which is a little attachment on her face there, and that's how the male anglerfish finds her. When he finds her, he attaches to her back, so he bites onto her back with her jaws, and then his jaws fuse her body and then he lives parasitically off of her blood supply until ultimately he shrivels away into only a pair of gonads that supplies sperm as needed. The ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate, the I mean, ultimate, I, I mean, the ultimate dad, there it is right there, you know, <laughs> sacrifice himself uh, for the good of the species. 
I tell you, uh, we should be giving awards to the anglerfish. It is an underrated species that needs to be recognized more uh, for the accomplishments that the males make and the sacrifices they make. I tell you what, so I'm glad we get to talk about it in this talk. I'm glad you guys are learning about it uh, because, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just oh, no. bizarre. Just a bizarre thing um, that this there little he guy is. right here, there's a, that if you if you were trying to find where the male is, there's an up close version of him. So um, crazy, yeah, pretty pretty wild place out there in the animal kingdom. But um, you know, Doc, I, I don't think we're too different. I mean, well, you know, when, we, when we start exactly looking, when we start I, looking at at humans, you know, from a very very early age, um, you know, we're surrounded by either romance or relationships or you know love or what to do, what not to do. Um, and it's really all around us. And we get maybe a lot of inspiration from the animals like the Adelaide penguin. Yeah, you know, I hate to say, but um, in a normally somewhat monogamous pair, the females have been known to prostitute themselves if the male presents them with a nice shiny rock. So the Adelaide penguin chooses its mate by the male bringing a specific type of rock. And if, he, if they pair up with a male, they will pair up with that male. But if another male comes by and has a shinier rock, um, then that female will say, oh, you have a shinier rock. I'm going to go with you. Um, I mean, that just sounds... Uh, oh, touche, like, touche. Yeah, sounds like something that we may do. Okay, let's let's just move on. Right. Um, uh, to the victor goes the spoils of the, uh, the, the penguins that bring the shiniest rock. Um, and then we also have some animals out there that will use um, flair, if you will, to potentially well attract a mate. Uh -huh. uh, of course, the peacock is one of them. And then we have uh, the frigate bird. The frigate bird. So that strange thing um, below his beak there takes him about 20 minutes to inflate during a breeding ritual. However, extremely important because again, the female will choose the male with the largest balloon and the brightest balloon. And when they're breeding, the male actually takes his wings and covers her eyes so that she cannot see another bird with a bigger balloon and leave him. I tell you, I mean, that's successful. See, I mean, these guys know what they're doing. Um, and that large, you know, kind of red sack that he blows up, the color of it, the size of it, the female is looking at all these things. And as you said, the male that has the brightest, the largest, that means that that's a really strong genetic male. And so that female is saying, hey, I'm gonna choose the male that's got you know, the strongest genes. I mean, again, an evolutionary trait to be able to do. And um, I don't know, do we do this in our in the human world? You know, I don't see any similarities here, I, yeah. Ted. I mean, no. I, I, yeah, it doesn't seem like we no. follow along any of those um, showing no. off or, yeah, I don't think that, I don't think that at all. Uh, the birds are definitely, they're showing off, um, you know, and have some extraordinary dances that they will do. Beautiful plumage. Look at that. Beautiful plumage. A lot of times it is the male that will have that beautiful plumage. So again, the best example is a peacock. The male peacocks have the bright, vibrant colors. The females are a little bit more dusky and dull and gray. Um, and that's because that male has got to show off. Um, and that's, that's peacocking out there. Uh, also, um, building nests helps. I mean, building the home. Um, is, you know, the females are going to look at, you know, does this guy provide a home and is it a good nest? I mean, that's important. Yeah. Does this guy know what he's doing? Yeah. And if you build a stable nest, a large enough nest, that female may say, um, yeah, maybe you could be a good mate. Um, and, uh, you know, or it could be um, like the Brower bird who is decorating their nest. Yeah. Um, and the females actually of this species um, will choose their mate based on how fancy, not only how fancy, but how well organized. And so if you notice all of the colors in that bird's nest are blue and other ones will collect specific colored rocks or even specific colored beetles, again, all the same size and all the same shape. And that shows attention to detail. So I guess I'm just being a, uh, a male brower bird today with my blue 
plumage uh, vibrantly displaying here. Uh, <laughs> just taking my just. You know, hints uh, from nature. I mean, it's just, you know, the brower bird, what an amazing animal. And what's great is the brower bird will, come, will kind of stand back and the female will come down. He just has to stand back and the female will inspect and look around and be like, hmm, I don't know. You know, <laughs> this one seems a little bit out of place. Um, I think this one might be ADD or OCD here um, and <laughs> not much. OCD enough. Um, and um, it's putting this one over here. I mean, they can be pretty uh, particular with um, with be their pickiness. Of, As they should. You know, but again, you know, the ladies like what they like. Um, luckily, there's um, enough ladies out there. So if one doesn't quite like the blue color, the next lady may come by and love it. So exactly. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of choices out Sounds there. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we really do I, this yeah. with, with our houses, and we don't really again do houses and boats. I, yeah, I just don't see it. I don't see it, Jed. <laughs> you know, again, you know, just taking a lot of things from nature here. Um, now, so far, we haven't really talked about monogamy, and you know, it's it's a somewhat of a human trait, but there's also some animals out there that will mate for life. Yeah, Jed, I, true monogamy um, in the animal kingdom really is rare. Um, there are very few species that actually do mate for life. Um, animals such as, say, the gray wolf. Um, we have certain species of birds like albatross, for example. There are even some fish that do it, um, French angelfish to be specific. Uh, so it, it's an unusual trait um, and very rare to come across humans. Turtle doves, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think the turtle doves are definitely one that um, we think of. And, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, I mean, a lot of um, animals, it is the strongest that survive. And so if you end up getting too old and you can't take care of your pride of lions and a younger, stronger male lion comes by, um, they're going to overthrow you and then they're going to get the rights to breed with all those females. I mean, with some of these species, they stay connected and um, they bond together. They, you know, have lifelong relationships. And um, like you said, it's not something that we commonly see in the animal kingdom, uh, but it does exist. And, and, um, our, and our not only that, are definitely one yeah, of some, some of those species will actually co-rear their young, which again, um, mating for life and co-rearing their young, cuddling, showing affection, which we consider um, oftentimes a very human trait, um, is, is unusual in the animal kingdom. I love it. So we can't get through one of our talks with us without talking about conservation. It's so important here at the Zoological Society, at the zoo, for what we do. Um, conservation is ingrained in everything. It's one of the main pillars of why a zoo exists. And um, we can't talk about love in the animal kingdom without talking about conservation, because without protecting critical habitats, uh, these animals don't have an ecosystem to be able to reproduce. And so it's so important for an animal like a panda, who uh, a few decades ago was critically endangered on the risk of extinction, but proper management went in to protect that habitat and um, then to make sure that there was enough individuals out there of breeding age that they can reproduce because reproduction in pandas is, is pretty challenging. I mean, they've got a lot of challenges for the success of their species. Yeah, they're, they're another species, Jed, that um, they spend 90% of their day um, consuming food and a very specific food at that. They're only receptive for breeding uh, three to four days out of an entire year. And so when you don't have that many of them, and we have a very restricted food source um, that makes reproduction and ultimately conservation a, a very big challenge. And as everyone knows, the giant panda, um, all giant pandas are owned uh, by central China. And so the pandas that are in zoos across the country um, are leased from China. Um, again, this has become a very successful um, adventure as of recent, but wasn't um, originally. And another bear that's in kind of dire straits right now is our polar bear, 
who really needs the frozen tundra to not only be able to hunt for their seals, for their food, um, but it's also where they may find a mate. And so um, their habitat is in a lot of challenges and struggles right now. Uh, and, and that's why conservation is so important. That's why the zoo is involved in conservation. One of our conservation projects is with flamingos. Yeah, and, and this is a really exciting one for us because we do have a successful breeding flock of Chilean flamingos. Um, and what we're even more excited about, Jed, is that in this month, we will have a new, brand new exhibit for our entire flock of Chilean flamingos to move to. Um, back to the conservation briefly, um, what I'm really excited about personally is that our zoo is part of a SAFE program and SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction and our own director, Sue Tygelski, um, is the lead in this program. And this is responsible for um, conservation of these birds as well as other species of flamingo in the wild. And so we're pretty proud, proud to be the lead um, specifically for these birds. Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of flamingos, again, their habitats rely on uh, water sources, clean water sources, with enough food in those water sources to be able to survive. Uh, they will also build these nests that are up off the ground. They need uh, proper soil to be able to do that and proper temperatures to be able to incubate those eggs and have successful offspring. And a lot of the areas, especially in Chile, um, the areas where flamingos are is being mined for lithium. And lithium is found in a lot of our batteries, a lot of our phones. And the mining leaches chemicals into the water sources, into the soil um, that uh, can make it very toxic for flamingos and they end up not being able to survive. Um, having weak eggs, so their eggs don't fully incubate full term. Um, and we're seeing a decrease in flamingo numbers. So that conservation project that Sue is the project leader for, uh, it's Reed Park Zoo's job and mission to be able to educate everyone out there and be the lead on talking about flamingos. It's a really exciting thing. And Alexis, as you said, it's really exciting because we are so close to moving our flock of flamingos up to the front of the zoo to their brand new habitat. So some very exciting stuff going around our flamingos. And then we've also touched on our elephants, the success story that we've had with our elephant herd. Um, we have been partnered with Dr. Char Charles Foley, who is a conservationist on the Terengari National Park who over the last two decades have been able to protect over a million acres of habitat that not only elephants use, but all of our wildlife that lives in that area. It's a critical migration corridor for these animals during the dry season as the outside areas dry up. The Terengari River is the only annual water source. These animals will come in and will be able to sustain through the dry season. Wet season comes, they migrate out. Um, so by having these animals there, and when, I, when we were there um, last February, we went to Terengari National Park and saw large herds of elephants that were um, a lot of calves, just like Penzi's age, um, all the way up Nandi's age, all these really successful, amazing family groups. Conservation works. It is where these animals can migrate. It is where they feed. It is where they find mates. It is where they breed. It is where they have successful offspring. It is where the survival of their entire species exists. Uh, it is all connected in one thing. We are part of that and we here at the zoo are just so empowered to be able to reach the mountaintops and be able to teach that story and tell that story. Um, and that's why I talk like this is a little bit, you know, different from our normal zoo talk, but it's still so, so important because it really surrounds, you know, all those topics of what we are doing and why we are here. Um, so uh, let's just recap what we've learned. You know, love is, love is worth the trip. Um, you know, animals take long distances to be able to find a mate and you know it's worth it to be able to do that. Internet dating, yes, it's a thing. SSP. SSP. The Species Survival Plan is a large internet dating source for our animals in uh, human care. Um, arguments happen, there's disputes that happen in the animal world, but remember that um, you know we all do some weird things for love. 
Um, so, uh, you know, whether or not you're a dog or you're this gentleman who is um, rocking his, his, own, his own thing, which I love, um, but, uh, you know, make love, not war. And uh, remember that uh, love conquers all. So um, it's, it's a great message, I think, to end our talk on. Um, it really wraps up everything that we have covered. Uh, I'm hoping that all of you that are on here had a good time, that you learned something new, that you got a laugh, that you um, are gonna take something away, whether or not it's just Alexis and I that we're crazy, um, or you know that you do have a fun anecdote or some more information. So at this point, you know, we did say that you know we can take some questions. Um, Alexis, I don't know if you can see the chat at all. If we do have any questions, I can see the chat, Jed. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna try to stop sharing. Uh oh, what happened? Are we still there? Did you disconnect everybody? I'm hoping I didn't. Is everyone still there? Send us a message if you're still there. I think we're still there. No, we're still here. Thank you. Oh yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> I stopped sharing it all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, where'd everything go? Uh, okay, so Alexis, do we have any questions? Uh, we don't have any questions yet. Everyone is, uh... Everyone is specifically loving your boa. Oh, thanks. Ah, yes. Me too. It's a little warm though. I should have turned the air conditioner on. I don't know how birds do this, man. <laughs> like that's why they don't have fur on their or feathers on their legs, because man, it's uh, you know, it it it's a little it's a little toasty uh, with this thing with my with my light on, so you guys can see me in my office here. Um, but I don't uh, think I don't think we have any specific questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, here's one that just came in. Is there an international ruling and control of zoos? You want to take that um, one? Sorry, go ahead, Jed. What? No, I was going to say, you, you want to take that one with the AZA? It, yeah, there's a there's a AZA association, which is uh, American Association of, of Zoos and Zoological Society, um, that when we say control, uh, and rule, all zoos across the country, both nationally and internationally, are intimately connected. I spend a great deal of my time talking to veterinarians, um, both in our country and across the world, um, just because there's so much to learn and so much that we don't know about all of these amazing creatures that we get the pleasure and the humility to work with. Um, so when decisions are made about animals, it is not generally just an internal decision. And that has to do with everything from nutrition to preventative medicine to veterinary care to even political decisions about how um, habitats are constructed and which animals are housed with uh, which animals. So it, that's a great question. And ultimately, my summary answer is every zoo across the country is connected. Yeah, and, yeah and, and there's definitely different accreditations. Um, the AZA is the highest accreditation that we have in the United States. So our AZA zoos are kind of saying that those facilities are upholding the highest standard of animal care, um, but every facility has to have some sort of accreditation or at least standards, especially from USDA. Um, so there's definitely you know controlling entities or uh, bodies out there that help regulate what we do. Um, so Alexis, I see another question about competition, um, is that uh, lions are competing and talking about other cats like tigers and jaguars. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of all of those animals there, you have competition. So um, if you have two male tigers in the same area as a uh, female that is in season, you're going to get a battle. Yeah, I, I think the only difference is that um, tigers as well as jaguars um, I, these are mostly solitary cats. So these are cats that are not, um, they're very different than lions that are in more of a pride situation. And so um, if they do come across each other, it is oftentimes not even during the same time um, that there's a breeding situation going on. Okay, so um, here we go. Who is the most amorous animal at Reed Park Zoo? Um, who, who do you think? <laughs> oh, gosh. Who, who would you say? Uh, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, not, it's not you, Jed. It's not you. 
I, you know what? Come on. I was, <laughs> I thought my name was top of the list. You know, I just, I, I thought I was going to be at the top. That was a, you know, easy one for you. I tell you, know, you know, we've, got a, we've got a few birds that just really are lovely animals. Um, Jasiri is definitely very amorous. That's our male giraffe, as you pointed out. Um, he did not ever know that he wasn't tall enough. No, he didn't. No, he did not. Um, yeah, uh, I would probably say Herbie. Oh, um, yeah. Well, Herbie gets that. Yeah. Herbie, For, uh, Herbie that, longevity boy, and, yeah. that boy during breeding season has one thing on his brain, um, <laughs> so much so that we have to separate the females from him because he can't leave them alone. Sure, um, sure. So uh, I, I would say Herbie. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of an animal that we no longer have, has passed away. Uh, it was a Speaks gazelle that was very amorous with our rhinoceros. Oh, yes, right. Uh, much, to him, much to the rhinoceros system in dismay. <laughs> Again, wasn't tall enough, but tall enough to, as the ankle goes anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, where there's a will, there's a way, and he certainly had a will, and um, you know, he was he was very uh, amorous on uh, the rhino, which you know, hey, uh, sometimes you see that. But uh, all right, let's. Uh, can you speak about the taper breeding program at Reed Park Zoo? Yeah, that's another one of our SSPs. We've been very yeah, successful we with we our also yeah we also have a successful um, taper breeding program, and and we're very proud of that. And again. Um, our recommendations come directly from the SSP, as well as my um, evaluation of whether or not our male and our female um, are healthy enough to breed, um, and also whether or not we have a place to place any offspring that may be successfully born. And so we manage um, our tapers much to the same way that we do any of our other animals in the SSP. Yeah, and the other thing that we're involved with with our taper offspring is um, taking pictures as those calves get older for conservationists. Um, conservationists are usually not able to find a taper. They usually will get a picture of them on a camera trap, and they're trying to identify um, different characteristics that, you know, are they male, or are they female, um, and potentially how old they are, because as juveniles, as babies, as infants, um, they have striped markings on them, so they look like a little watermelon. Um, but as they age, they start to lose those stripes. So we, because we've had successful offspring, have taken pictures um, every week so that, and we were working with other zoos to do that with different species of tapers as well, that we can create a data bank for researchers to be able to know how old, potentially how old the taper is that they capture. So um, a lot of things going on with our taper and um, you know that whole breeding program. Somebody asked, who is Herbie? Herbie is our big male Aldabra tortoise, our big male Aldabra tortoise. Um, so then we got one um, that's talking about the sexual female or, or the female sexual organ of an elephant. And um, their anatomy is, is very interesting. Um, and you know, why is it hanging down? Um, and this is something when a calf is first born, sometimes we don't know if it's a male or female because they can have a similar looking sexual organ. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think the question is, um, you know, when we're looking at uh, what is their belly button, which is a very prominent actually in a female elephant that can easily be confused for a penis. Yep, so they have that uh, kind of umbilicus is a little bit ahead, um, but their vulva is actually low down to the ground as well. Um, it's not, you know, up near the, the anus or the rectum, so it is kind of lower down, um, whether or not that's so that the male can probably copulate easier. Um, do, you, do you know if there's an evolutionary reason? Yeah, why? It, lar largely positional, Jed. Yep. So, um, yeah, very interesting there. But um, again, the the female, well, all the elephants will have that umbilicus, that belly button. So that might be misconstrued as a penis. So um, uh, let's see. What else do we got? Any information? Blah, 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 blah. Um, I saw there. another one here. Oh, our non-breeding companion animals. Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about um, you know animals that don't have a breeding recommendation but are still mixed sex habitat. Here, how do we manage that? Yeah, so it depends on the age, it depends on the species, but a lot of those animals um, are either housed differently depending on the time of the season or 
um, actually have specific types of birth control so that they are not able to breed. So for example, um, some of them will have a vaccine um, that prevents them from getting pregnant. Others will actually have a birth control implant, which is similar to what humans actually um, have. Um, in some of our larger primates, we can actually give them birth control pills like humans take. Yeah, and this is uh, a pretty common thing. We actually have a male lion that we just uh, brought in from the San Antonio Zoo. Um, we haven't introduced him to Cayaneo or to lionesses yet, but the plan will be to. And um, they are both on birth control implants, and that's kind of an annual implant, correct? Yeah, in lions now, it's every two years, which is really neat. Um, okay. And oftentimes, another question that I get asked uh, pretty often, Jed, about males in particular is, um, do you neuter a male lion? And we definitely try not to neuter them. Um, we actually do what's called a vasectomy, so just like they do in humans, because if we do neuter the male, they will actually lose their male sexual traits. So for example, their mane and look more like a female lion. Yeah, and there was actually a question about sexual dimorphism and telling the difference. Um, we do have that with some species, uh, like the lions, uh, not with all species, but, um, you know, I think it's fairly common with our mammals um, and some of our birds, but not always. Also, I mean, if we look at the crown cranes, um, the male and the female, you know, kind of carry the same sexual characteristics. So, um, you know, we do have some species that are sexually dimorphic. So just by looking at them, you can tell the difference between a boy and a girl and some that aren't. Yeah, exactly. Birds are probably the most notorious for this. There are several bird species that you just can't tell. And so the way that I determine it oftentimes is with blood. I, I have to actually blood sex them. Yeah, I mean, we'll take a little genetic sample, DNA sample, and um, that's how we'll kind of be able to tell. Um, all right, so there's a question about uh, schooling for you here, Dr. Roth. Uh, did you have to go through a specific veterinary program to be able to work with so many different species? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have been at the zoo now for almost, so let's see, 13, 14 years almost, it seems. Is that longer than you, Jed, or not? Um, I've been here 16 years. Ah, oh, jeez. I beat you. Yeah. You did beat me. Um, <laughs> you know, I went through, um, I got an undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona, and then I uh, went to veterinary school, which is an additional four years. Um, during veterinary school, you can specialize a little bit, um, large animal versus small animal. And I was lucky enough to go to Colorado State, where they had a pretty robust exotics program. Um, from there, I did an internship in Florida where I was able to get my foot in the door at Bush Gardens. Um, my mentor was actually the senior staff veterinarian at Bush Gardens. And so I was able to tag along there and really um, start to absorb. A lot of zoo medicine is learning uh, in the field. Um, they do not generally have zoo medicine classes in veterinary school. So that's all postgraduate training. But we are fortunate with our new veterinary hospital that we're going to be working with University of Arizona's new DVM program, and you are going to be teaching uh, vet students exotic animal medicine here at the zoo. So like you said, not a lot of zoos have that, um, but what a unique opportunity for those aspiring veterinarian students to learn not in a book, but right here at the zoo. Yeah, that, that was really important to me. So part of the veterinary school, like you said, has rotations through the zoo. And so one of their electives, um, if they have an interest in zoo medicine, will be to actually shadow me and go through rounds, accompany me on procedures, um, really get hands on learning. And um, I try to make that opportunity available to as many students as I can right now, because I know what it's like to be where they're at. It's such a small um, a very unique field, and it's it's such a humbling experience to be able to do what I do, and there isn't a day goes by that I take that for granted. Yeah, it's very exciting, um, and I will tell all of you, not just because I know Alexis, but she is absolutely amazing at what she does here, um, and the care that she gives our animals, um, the students that come in, the time that she gives to those students, uh, it, we're just very fortunate. So um, I, you, I'm Jeff. not just saying this because she's right here, or I don't know which way you are, uh, but um, you know we're very fortunate to to have um, you know Dr. Roth with with us, and you know it's it's really exciting to be able to teach you know these new students um, and give them a, a really great future. So 
Thank you, Jeff. Um, great work there, Doc. Thanks, uh, right. Jed. Let's, let's go over one more because um, I one know more we're, question. Getting, we're getting late. Um, and somebody has a question about our anteaters. Um, and I think this kind of can cover several animals that we may have in that you can do all the steps. You can get, you know, the SSP, you can look at all the genetics. Um, when you have solitary animals that are solitary in the wild, introducing them in a zoo can be challenging. Then getting along and reproducing can be even more challenging. And that's kind of the thing going on with our anteaters. Yeah, and so despite um, every successful opportunity that we make, ultimately it is their decision. And so we spend a lot of time trying to optimize um, everything about them. So their veterinary care, their nutrition, uh, their habitat. Um, but at the end of the day, it is their decision whether or not they will successfully breed. And, and sometimes um, that has to do with factors that are just beyond our control. And so um, we will continue to try to maximize and opportun opportunitize Opportun is that even a word, Jed? What time is it? <laughs> we've been going for a while. It's uh, completely acceptable this time. I haven't had any more time. of my wine we've, yet. We've been, we've been um, using a lot of words. So, oh, uh, Lord. Continue yes. to try to maximize their opportunities, for goodness sakes. Um, go. But um, at the end of the day, sometimes uh, we are not successful. Yeah, and I mean, just like you said, some animals are only receptive for very short windows. Um, lemurs are another one of those. We talked about the porcupine, um, and you know, it it can be dangerous. You know, I mean, are these anteaters, um, they don't have teeth, but they have extremely powerful claws um, and can injure each other. So there's there's a caution, there's a risk that's there, um, and we have to weigh all those things. And we do take things very slowly here. We want to make sure that the animals um, are showing us signs that uh, they are interested in each other um, to the best of their abilities and um, that we have the best chance at success. But again, it's up to them. And you know, sometimes we, we get very successful. Um, Zola, who is our female here, she was born here. Um, we do have Nico and the, the goal will be to introduce them at some point. And, and again, we're just taking it very slowly um, to, to optimize our success on you know, potential um, breeding and mating and, and having offspring. Um, so with that, um, again, I just want to say thank you to all of you guys that are still on. I know a couple of you guys have jumped off, but the majority of you guys have stuck with us all the way to the end. Um, so we truly appreciate you guys supporting Reed Park Zoo for this Valentine's Day for Woo at the Zoo 2021. Such a bizarre uh, year doing this virtually with you guys. Usually we're, you know, doing it live, but I'm so glad that this came together, um, that you guys were able to join us. Hopefully you guys had fun. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Roth and joining us and bringing all the expertise um, that you have and the science, the background. Um, it's so informative. I learn something new every time I talk to Alexis. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's great. It's a lot of fun for us to be able to do something like this and, uh, you know, bring you guys hopefully a fun and exciting evening. So with that, from all of us here at Reed Park Zoo, we want to wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Stay happy safe, Valentine's Day, everyone. Stay wild. And we will see you guys later. Good night, guys. Good night.